All right, well, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's edition of the Polyploid webinar. Uh, up first today is Dr. Joe Williams. Uh, Joe is a professor at the University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville, and his lab studies the origin of poly pollen tube growth innovations in flowering plants. And today he's going to tell us a little bit about that research uh, and how that intersects with polyploidy uh, in his talk on polyploidy and pollen performance obstacle or opportunity. With that, I'll let Joe take it away. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, you nailed it. Uh, um, thanks a lot for, for giving me the opportunity to, to reach the polyploid audience. And uh, so I'll be talking more about phenotypes than about genetics today. And hopefully I can attract some interest and questions. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, people. Um, John Reese has uh, recently graduated and he worked on pollen tube growth rate evolution. He's, he's uh, in your neighborhood now, for those of you in Arizona up at San Juan College. Um, and, uh, and then I had a great collaboration with Paolo Oliveira when he did a sabbatical in my lab a few years back. Um, and we worked on pollen tube size effects on uh, polyploids. And then I'm gonna talk at the end about uh, some work I've done in quarantine. <laughs> so I thought I'd thank all the people who really thought about this more deeply than I have over the last century. So I don't really have any collaborators on that. It's a computer job. So uh, pollen is a single-celled organism, as you all know, um, or maybe you don't. Uh, its performance is really an evolved compromise between a lot of different functions. Um, and, and the great thing about pollen is, that, as a single-celled organism, is that it is the actual site of whole genome duplication. Um, so that happens in the pollen grain uh, or in the egg cell. Um, but a pollen grain itself develops to a multicellular organism, and in flowering plants, it really only produces um, three cells. Uh, the generative cell, which is formed by mitosis, goes on to form the two sperm, but they're really carried within the cytoplasm of the vegetative cells. It's, it's a really odd morphology. But that whole lumen of the pollen grain is taken up by the vegetative cell. And that cell is what performs, if you will, um, and functions. And uh, as a pollen gets released, it gets dehydrated usually, and not always somewhat, um, and then when it hits the signet, it rehydrates again. Uh, most of you are probably think from this uh, view about pollen, uh, pollinator arrives at a flower and picks up pollen uh, and then takes it to another flower where it germinates and grows a pollen tube, which carries the sperm down to the egg. And, and during that time, you, know, you have all these different functions that, that um, affect it, its evolution. Um, as pollen tubes, which are an extension of the vegetative cell, so it's still a single cell, as they grow down to the egg, they're carrying the pollen, uh, they're carrying the sperm, um, and they can compete or not, uh, but the intensity of competition will obviously affect their, their evolution as well. So I've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years or so thinking about this comparative analysis that we've done. Um, and um, and published in, uh, a year ago or two years ago. Um, but really, uh, it shows that, that angiosperm, angiosperms have evolved a, a spectacularly diverse um, range of pollen tube growth rates and spectacularly fast when you compare it to any other kind of tip growing cell known in biology um, and um, to any other kind of pollen tube. The gymnosperm pollen tubes really only grow at 19 microns an hour at the most. And you can see that you know, all these independent origins of really fast pollen tube growth in eumagnolias, monocots, uh, asterids, uh, rosids, you have these accelerations of pollen tube growth rate. You have slowdowns as well, but um, on the whole, angiosperms have developed these fast growth rates. And so what are the causes of that, that evolution? And it uh, you know, occurred to us a, a while ago, but that, uh, uh, actually, during my PhD, I studied pollen tube growth rates of polyploids. But um, pollen performance is always said to hap happen in the haploid um, phase of the, the life cycle, the male greenophytes haploid, right? And, and haploid phases of, of haploid diploid life cycles are subject to faster evolutionary rates. And everybody here knows that polyploidy is a feature of angiosperms, both in the past and in the present. So that really means that you know, over the course of angiosperm evolution, that history that I'm interested in reconstructing, pollen performance has actually often been occurring um, during polyploid phases or, or not, but 
on performance itself has happened during the polyploid phases of evolution as well as diploid phases. So the natural question then, get this thing out of my way, or not. Natural question then is how does uh, uh, polyploid, how does polyploidy affect uh, pollen performance? So uh, the first thing that, that John Reese and I looked at was uh, genome size, because genome size, whether or not it's due to polyploidy, is thought to be one, uh, have uh, one effect on uh, performance rates. And you can see in gymnosperms that there's a negative correlation between um, genome size, uh, at least DNA content, and pollen tube growth rates, but uh, not so much in angiosperms. So, uh, why is that so? Why are the correlations there or not? Um, I decided to look at phenotypic effects of larger genome size. We all know that uh, there are nucleotypic effects on cell size, and that's thought to be a, largely a genome size effect, a passive effect of having larger genome, uh, having the nucleus having to accommodate more chromosomes, more proteins, the cytoplasm um, also having to accommodate proportionally more uh, proteins and whatnot. And so therefore the, the larger cell size is supposed to be an epigenetic uh, aspect of just bulk DNA amount. But we all know that you know, when genome size increases by whole genome duplication, you also have you know, doubling of genes. And so that you have all these genetic effects um, that can also maybe impact um, cell size. And so a uh, nucleotypic effect, I'm going to put it in quote marks because I like using it, but actually in the strict sense, um, we don't really know what proportion of the effects are due to epigenetics and what are due to genetics. So let's just call it new nucleotypic effects with an asterisk, <laughs> recognizing that both effects are probably there. But really the point I want to make here is that um, when you think about the phenotypic effects of whole genome duplication for pollen, or uh, pollen tubes at least, um, you might think that there's larger cell size, um, but also there are effects that are due to uh, increased gene expression. Whoops. And the effects that are due to genes are, uh, could be metabolic effects. There are known lots of physiological effects due to um, heterozygosity and gene dosage. And the effects that are due to physical effects, um, construction effects of having more work to do to make a larger cell and larger things uh, in general. So um, to the, the question I'm really interested in asking about pollen tube growth rate evolution is what are the costs of doubling your genome size and are they offset by double genome number or double gene number? <laughs> so when you look at this graph again, you know, you wonder why there's a negative correlation in gymnosperms and, and people might say, oh, there's no relationship here in angiosperms, so there's nothing going on. But actually, the slope of this effect has changed from being negative in gymnosperms to positive or, or to neutral in angiosperms, but it's a positive shift. And why, why is there that shift? And um, you know, it's the mechanism of, of genome size change that I think is really important here, that you think about how angiosperms have undergone lots of cycles of whole genome duplication and genome downsizing. And um, genome size change in gymnosperms has not really had that same kind of um, mechanism for the most part. So that suggests that, that uh, increases in gene number have affected pollen tube growth rates, have had energetic effects on, on pollen tubes in angiosperms. Well, is that really true? We can look at polyploids now instead of just genome size. Um, obviously, you want to look at as close to whole genome duplication as you can. The effect of pure polyploidy would be the goal here, um, and the closest you can get to that uh, perhaps is intraspecific diploid autotetraploid cytotype pairs. There are not that many studies on that, but when you compare, when you look at the studies that have compared pollen tube growth rates between um, actually 1x and 2x pollen, um, pollen tube growth rates, they're generally slower or the same. Um, so there seems to be a slight penalty on growth um, at, at inception, just at the time of whole genome duplication. If you look, if you map those polyploids um, that are above the base uh, genus number, definition of polyploidy, um, 
we mapped as many as we could onto this phylogeny. And the polyploids, um, actually there's, there were about a, th a third as many polypo neo polyploids as diploids, which is about what you see um, in nature anyway. And the polyploids uh, seem to be evolving around a much higher optimum pollen tube growth rate than the diploids. In fact, threefold faster if you wanna quantify that. So that's, that's interesting because, you know, at inception, it looks like there's not much of a, an effect, but um, when you get out to the species level, there's a lot more effects. We didn't classify what kinds of polyploids we were looking at, autopolyploids, allopolyploids, uh, hexaploids, um, et cetera. But it does suggest that faster pollen tube growth rates are evolving during polyploid phases of history. Um, so uh, the next question I had then was to, to look at what the actual costs are. Um, when a pollen tube grows, it you know, extends its tip. And we think of pollen tube growth rate as the, the amount of extension per time. So it's growth in length of the tube. Well, that doesn't really get at the energetics of pollen tube growth, which are really based on how much wall material is being made to extend that tip forward. Um, and um, generally, if you double the size of a cell, um, you increase its diameter by about 26%. But if you double the size of a tube, you increase its volume by 40. I mean, you double the volume of a tube, you increase its diameter by 41%. Um, so that's a big um, difference in the amount of wall material that tube has to make to grow forward at the same rate as its diploid progenitor. So how did the cost of wall production impact pollen tube growth rate? Uh, this is where Paolo Oliveira and I did this nice study. We both had systems uh, where we had diploid and hexaploid uh, close relatives. So we, and we already had the, the material. So we, we thought we'd look at that a few years back. And the nice thing is that Betchel has really slow pollen tube growth rates and Handoranthus um, in Brazil has very fast pollen tube growth rates. So we could look at the costs of wall production and how those impact pollen tube growth rate. Remember, um, the tube is you know, growing forward at a length per time, and it has a wall that has a thickness, and that, that thickness, you know, all that wall material is being made right behind the tip. And that wall material, that wall material has to be produced right behind the tip at the same rate that the pollen tube is growing forward to keep that forward growth going. So you can really take the cross section of the pollen tube and measure the circumference and the width of that tube and then multiply it by the pollen tube growth rate to, to really get an estimate of how much bulk wall material is being produced per unit of time. That makes sense. And here's how you do it. You take a style with pollen tubes growing through it, you stain them, and you collect them at time A and time B, and then you subtract the lengths at time B from those at time A, and you get the average amount of distance the pollen tube has grown per unit of time. And then you take the material from from uh, time B, and you, you put it in uh, glycol methacrylate, which is like a plastic, and then you section it really thin, like five micron thick sections, and then you uh, stain it and look at it under the microscope and measure the width of the wall, which you can actually do, and the circumference. And then you multiply those two together to get the amount of wall material per one unit of growth. So here you can see a a uh, haploid pollen tube of Betula occidentalis and a triploid pollen tube of Betula papyrifera. So here again are the, the actual numbers here. The, the width of the, the hexaploid um, was larger um, and the, the thickness of the wall was about the same, not much different. But the total amount of wall material per one unit of growth was 13% larger in the triploid pollen tube than in the diploid pollen tube. So that means that Betula papyrifera had 13% higher construction costs per unit of growth, um, which means more work. And if all else is equal, um, that's gonna result in slower pollen tube growth rate, unless you can do something to speed up your metabolic rates. But for now, let's just say uh, more work is, is required. And the pattern in Handoranthus was the same, um, even more extreme actually. Um, Handoranthus had 25% larger tubes in terms of thickness times um, circumference. So uh, 
more work, slower pond tube growth rate. So let's go back to Betula. Um, we can actually use that am amount of wall material to predict what the pollen tube growth rate should be if there were no other effects. In other words, you could take the wall production rate of the diploid here and divide it and scale it to the amount of wall material that needs to be made if you're, if you're a triploid instead of diploid. And that's gonna give you the predicted pollen tube growth rate of the triploid. And in my case, it was uh, 34 divided by four, um, 8.4 microns per hour is the predicted pollen tube growth rate of that polyploid pollen tube. I, it's weird that nobody can raise their hand and <laughs> I can't look at them and see if anybody has a question, but let me know if you do. Um, so the nucleotypic effect um, on pollen tube growth rate of Betula papyrifera pollen tubes, they should be 15 and a half percent slower than um, the diploid relative. That makes sense. And then we had the same thing in Handoranthus, they should be about 20% slower than their diploid relative. But in fact, they weren't quite that much slower. The actual pollen tube growth rates of Betula papyrifera were only about 10% slower. And the actual rates of uh, Handoranthus ceratifolia were only about 6% slower. So why don't the predictions match? The reason is, um, that difference there between the predicted and the actual is actually a positive effect on pollen tube growth rate. And the only thing we could think of that would be have a positive effect um, would be metabolic benefits of whole genome duplication. Um, so you could think of this as the genotypic effect of whole genome dupli duplication, nucleotypic effect, you know, of the effect of genome size, reduce your increase the amount of work reducing your pollen tube growth rate, but you also had some effect from having doubled the amount of genes. And that's consistent with findings uh, that, you know, when you duplicate whole networks, a whole metabolic network um, of genes that you can get positive benefits. So it looks like whole genome duplication seemed to enable faster evolution of pollen tube energetics, at least in terms of explaining the fact that there's a, a penalty to uh, poly, polyploid growth in terms of the amount of work to do, um, but polyploids seem to have evolved faster growth rates. But what I didn't mention is that um, these tubes are wider in the polyploids, but they actually should be a lot wider <laughs> than 13 or 25%. You know, a whole genome duplication, if it's doubling the volume of a tube, it should have a 41% larger diameter. And if it's doubling it twice to get to the hexaploid, level of the triploid for pollen tubes, you ought to see an 82% increase in tube width. And, and there are super large tubes out there in, in gymnosperms and stuff like 100 microns and above, but not so much in angiosperms. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, what happened here, you must have had a lot of reduction in tube size as well after whole genome duplications. Something else must be going on um, to reduce the cost of construction. It's not just that you've evolved faster metabolic rates, but you've also evolved smaller tubes. But I don't have the data on that. I don't have the what happened after whole genome duplication in Betula. And that would be what you'd need to get to understand what the magnitude of that effect of whole genome duplication was in Betula and Handoranthus. You need to know if whole genome duplication actually did result in a 41 or an 82% increase in, in pollen tube uh, width, which then subsequently evolved to be smaller. So are there studies that have compared 1x and 2x uh, pollen tube diameters? Yes, only one that I can find so far, um, uh, at least for in vivo. And, and this is in a hybrid, so it's not an ideal um, study. And it's also comparing haploid versus diploid pollen in the same anther, so unreduced diploid pollen. Um, so it's not quite what we're after, but it's, it's not bad. And not only that, they got the 43% increase in diameter of the polyploid. So that is consistent with what we predict. Um, but it turns out that pollen tube diameter is correlated with um, pollen grain diameter um, pretty closely, uh, in, at least in, in some species. And, and in the, the Gao work that I just talked about, 
their, their one end pollen had a pretty good correlation with pollen tube diameter and so did their two end pollen. And if you look at back in some old studies, you can see even among species, you get this positive correlation between pollen grain size and pollen tube size. So why not look at pollen grains? There's literally hundreds of studies of pollen grain sizes. Um, um, here you can see one uh, in Adansonia. But uh, going all the way back to 1907, the first mention of the word polyploidy um, was accompanied by uh, measurements of diploid versus haploid pollen sizes. So I decided to do that in my quarantine. Um, what did you do over your summer vacation? <laughs> I looked at the literature um, and I looked at, um, I tried to answer these questions. What's the effect of whole genome duplication on pollen size? And how much does pollen size change after whole genome duplication, if it does? But remember in theory, the nucleotypic effect on an, an ideal cell, meristematic cell say, should be a doubling in volume um, if you don't have a, a vacuole or other things that are affecting size. And mature pollen doesn't have a vacuole. So it really is cytoplasm and nucleoplasm um, governing those sizes. So you, you might expect a double size. And um, when people measure pollen grain size, uh, pollen can be either dehydrated like in an herbarium specimen or acetolysis, or it can be live taken straight from the anther and put in stain. But in either case, people usually rehydrate the grains before they measure them, whether they're dried or um, live. And so you get a relatively spherical um, pollen size. But even the diameter of a dried pollen is going to reflect the diameter of the um, hydrated pollen. So for the most part, the, my pollen grains were spherical uh, in the study, but there are some that weren't, but uh, didn't seem to make a, a much of a difference. So uh, again, to double volume, if your volume doubles, uh, your diameter doesn't double. It actually doubles. Um, the, the diameter actually increases by a factor of uh, 1.26. You can do the math. I'm not going to go through it, but here's an actual measurement. You can see there increases of a 1.27 fold increase in this particular example. So what would we expect in in uh, since doubling, you know, happens instantly? The nucleotypic effect results in a uh, 1.26 increase in diameter, a doubled volume. Um, and that's very likely to be um, uh, to affect the function of that pollen, especially if, if it's evolved to be its particular size for, for some reason. Um, so subsequently, you would expect evolution to act pretty quickly to affect that pollen size, whether it's an opportunity or an obstacle uh, might gain it access to new phenotypic space. So the questions then are, what, what is the magnitude of the nucleotypic effect? Predict a two-fold difference in um, two-fold larger 2N pollen versus 1N pollen. And then the second question is, is there evidence for post-WG evolution? And that would be by taking, um, taking evolutionary young pollen and comparing it to evolutionarily old 2N pollen. And you predict that the older 2N pollen would have been affected by um, subsequent evolution. So I looked at 252 spare pairs of intraspecific cytotypes. These were either within diploids or between uh, diploids and autotetraploids. I excluded all anything that was clearly an allotetraploid. I included some autotetraploids that might have you might consider to be shaky um, in terms of the evidence for autopolyploidy, but um, but generally, I, I uh, included autotetraploids if they were within species and had the typical indicators of autotetraploidy. And I measured the pollen size effect, which was the, the log of the diploid pollen diameter minus the log of the haploid pollen diameter, since diameter is what people usually measure. And then I averaged um, within species um, so that I only was comparing species. Um, and then I took the pollen sources and divided up into four classes. Either the, the pollen, the diploid and the haploid pollen came from a diploid pollen parent by errors of meiosis. So you have, you know, um, non-reduced pollen. And then there were three types of tetraploids. Either tetraploidy was induced 
or spontaneous and, and the researcher knew it. And it was within you know, zero or one to five generations of um, that, that um, artificial polyploidy. And then I took old cultivar, cultivars that were tetraploid cultivars that had you know, clearly more than five generations of, of evolution in fields or greenhouses or whatever. And then I took established wild uh, tetraploid cytotypes. And here's the data. Um, first of all, the non-reduced pollen. Um, here's the pollen size effect here on the y-axis. You can see that 1.26, 1.26 is the double volume expectation. And the non-reduced pollen tended to be larger, the 2N pollen tended to be larger than double. Um, I'm not gonna go into why, there are a lot of methodological reasons, but also it does seem to be, even when the methods are really good, you see that non-reduced pollen is slightly larger than 1.26. If you look at the recent induced polyploids in the old cultivars, they are not significantly different from 1.26, and then the wild ones are smaller. So in terms of question one, whole genome duplication, I think there's good evidence that um, it in incurs double volume. You have you know, 58 pairs that almost exactly hit the 1.26 mark. And then older pairs seem to also still be close to 1.26. And for the second question, we can now take 1.26 as an inferred uh, effect of whole genome duplication. And then uh, the, the effect of um, having to survive in the wild for who knows how many generations um, suggests that you evolved from a 1.26 diameter down to some smaller diameter in almost all species. So I like to visual effects. So here's your doubled pollen size. Your effect of whole genome duplication um, is uh, the so-called nucle nucleotypic effect was consistent with the twofold nucleotypic effect. And then you have a subsequent to that, you have 44% reduction in pollen size in, in wild uh, populations. So, um, you know, I didn't set up the study to look at the mechanisms for that, but there were some things I could take a look at and I just thought I'd try for a genome downsizing first. If genome size controls pollen size, then after whole genome duplication, you should be going through down, genome down, downsizing as a result of relaxed selection on, on genes. And um, that could be causing smaller pollen size to evolve just as a, an effect, a correlated effect of that. Um, and in fact, you know, I could only find uh, cytotype information for 14 pairs and they're not exactly the, the plants that that the pollen size was measured in. So with a grain of salt, um, you can see that the, there is evidence for genome si downsizing in, in those species. But if, if pollen size um, is correlated with genome size, then as, as pollen size decreases, as, as smaller pollen sizes are evolving below that 1.26 level, the 1CX genome size should also um, proportionally get smaller. So you should see a positive correlation here and, and we don't see anything like a positive correlation. So, um, so that's interesting, but no evidence for uh, genome size effect, at least among 14 pairs. So pollen size is obviously being selected by lots of different things. There are many possible targets. And uh, we, I just looked at one of them. One is that the pollen dispersal distance is pretty directly linked to size for wind pollinated species and um, relative to animal pollinated species. So that could be dragging down that pollen size effect in the wild species. Um, and so you'd predict then in the wild populations that wind pollinated tetraploids would show a smaller pollen size effect than animal pollinated tetraploids, if that was so. And that was so, it turns out that um, you look at the data here, and, and I was able to get data on pollination vectors for almost all the species. Um, but really, you have a, a marginal, marginally smaller effect of wind pollination, both old cultivars and wild cytotypes. It's not a huge effect. And not only that, <laughs> it doesn't really explain the fact that, that both animal and wind pollinated species have a smaller than doubled volume of their pollen grains. So in conclusion then, um, 
you know, whole genome duplication happens in one or two sporophyte generations. Um, and um, whole genome duplication, in this case, I think I've shown pretty solidly that, that pollen cell diameter, vegetative cell diameter increases by a factor of 1.26. Um, and that really does, it, it really is consistent with what people have said is that whole genome duplication sets a lower limit of doubled vegetative cell volume, um, but you need at least a double cell size to accommodate the, the doubled genome size. And then I showed that in established tetraploids, um, the effect of uh, whole genome duplication was a lot less than 1.26x. Um, and that suggests that evolution after whole genome duplication is biasing pollen evolution to, to reductions. Um, not too surprising. You have 100% gain in volume, and then 44% of that two-fold gain is lost over time, is what my data suggests. And that's happening within species. So it's not happening, you know, over huge amounts of evolutionary time. But that also brings up uh, the tie to my previous work, and that was in trying to understand what happens to pollen tube growth rate. And pollen size clearly is, is being biased towards um, to evolve smaller size. And I didn't really figure out what a good cause for that would be. Um, but one cause, one potential cause would be post-pollination selection on pollen tube size. And at least in Betchel, I showed that after a couple of speciation events, at least, um, a couple of whole genome duplications, your pollen tube size is staying not much larger than the diploid size. And so there must be a lot of pollen selection on pollen tube sizes. And that could be because of competition with other pollen tubes. So smaller size means you can grow faster. You're putting that wall material into growing faster. Um, but it. Uh, in any case, whatever the, the mechanisms are for reducing pollen tube size, that could have correlated effects on pollen size uh, or maybe just independent effects. But um, in any case, these are two black boxes that I'd really like to explore further. And my last slide, <laughs> um, I've pretty much shown uh, in all this work that, that um, size phenotypes have always evolved back towards the progenitor-like values. And that means that polyploidy is generally an obstacle for maintaining ancestral pollen performance. Um, but it could also be an opportunity in some ways. I did show some evidence for metabolic evolution. And I also found that few polyploids returned all the way back to their progenitor life values. So thanks again, Mike, for, for having me. And I'll take any questions. All right, well, well, thank you, Joe. I think we're a little over time. Uh, so uh, in the transition here, we can uh, take some questions. Uh, and as always, we have plenty of time at the end. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to save those until then. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, feel free to, as usual, put those in the chat box and uh, uh, we'll work on those while we switch over slides. Um, I do see the first question from Hannes uh, Becker asking if uh, is this corrected for, phy for phylogeny. The, uh, the pollen tube size, uh, the pollen grain size, um, I chose not to correct for phylogeny. Uh, I did the wild stuff, corrected for phylogeny, the, the p-value was exactly the same. Um, but basically each of those comparisons is within a species. So each of those is independent um, evolution of a whole genome duplication. Um, so I, I took it that way. Um, right. All right. Well, I think we'll save the rest of those questions to the end until uh, after uh, Arthur's talk is finished uh, and then we can revisit all of those. So, so stick around and save any questions you might have for Joe until then. All right, our next speaker is uh, Arthur Zwanevel. Uh, and Arthur is a, uh, a graduate student, a uh, PhD student in the group of uh, E. van der Peer uh, at Ghent University. Uh, he's working on the uh, evolutionary importance of polyploidy and focused particularly on statistical phylogenetic models to infer whole genome duplications from comparative genomic data, uh, as well as modeling gene family evolution. Uh, more broadly, he's interested in theoretical uh, evolutionary genetics and probabilistic modeling and, and biology. And today he's going to tell us though about his work on polyploidy uh, with his talk, Statistical Inference of Whole Genome Duplications in a Phylogenetic Context. With that, I'll let Arthur take it away. Thanks a lot, Mike, um, for having me and thanks a lot for, yeah, for, provide, for inviting me for, to give this talk. Um, so today I want to talk a bit about uh, 
<laughs> my struggles with models. Um, so anyway, uh, this will be, uh, I hope it will be of interest to many or some of you. Um, it's not a finished story. It's not a very polished story, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> as we all know, um, so genome sequence data more or less confirmed what we always expected, namely that polyploidy is not only important in extant populations, but has affected uh, evolutionary history. Uh, well, basically across the tree of life has affected evolution of all, all sorts of lineages, but in particular in plants, it seems to be like all over the phylogeny. Um, and so this, this, well, this, this, this really became apparent when, when these genomes came flooding in, of course. Um, this raises a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, just looking at this, this kind of figure, which summarizes some tentative uh, uh, conclusions. Um, well, we, we can we, we can start pondering about uh, is, is polyploidy um, associated with diversification? Um, does it lead to key innovations? Is it is it is it more established in the phylogeny than we expect based on the current distribution of polyploids, or is it re really a dead end? And etc. All these kind of questions emerge when we start putting the, putting this in in this really this macroevolutionary framework. So um, lots of questions emerge, and all these questions um, basically in some way hinge, well, to answer those questions, we need to uh, be able to ascertain where in the phylogeny uh, genome duplications have taken place. And this um, is a phylogenetic task. It's a, and as we all know, phylogenetics is impossible. Um, we have some ex data from some extant lineages and uh, we have hundreds of million years to infer, and we have little more than the principle of common descent. So in my opinion, when we're faced with this massive uncertainty, what we need is uh, statistics, and what we need to do statistics are models. And, and when we use models, then we need to check the adequacy of our models. And basically, this talk will be about uh, the whole uh, hell you, you end up in uh, at that point, if you, if you want to do this. Uh, this 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 mission. Anyway, um, there there are three main I'd say. So there are three main uh, approaches. Let's say to infer um, uh, whole genome duplications from comparative genomic data. So I won't go into detail. You can use age distributions or something like that, where um, basically we use molecular distances or something like that across all gene duplicates, etc. It's an interesting approach. It has some pitfalls, but yeah, as I said, I won't go into that. Um, you can, if you have good genomes, and this is becoming more and more important nowadays since we, we're getting all these chromosome level assemblies, et cetera. Um, so you can, you can really compare genome structure and this can be a very rich in, uh, source of information to, to figure out uh, whole genome duplications uh, or, or other genome rearrangement events, et cetera. So that's another main class of methods. But then there's this class of methods, um, which has been particularly pop, uh, popular, often used also um, the more tricky ones uh, in the last decade, mainly um, to use phylogenomic methods. So to infer the whole bunch of gene families from a bunch of genomes you have available or transcriptomes um, to infer for all these gene families, trees, compare them to your tentative species tree hypotheses and um, figure out whether there is signal for a whole genome duplication in this data. The the task, uh, so the so the, the the issue that comes up in all these approaches is basically uh, the question: Is there signal in the data for a whole genome duplication against some kind of background genome evolution? And if you frame it like that, it's obvious you need a model, right? So what is this background genome evolution? So what do we expect to see in the absence of whole genome duplication? What do we expect to see in the presence of whole genome duplications, et cetera? So this is, this is really the starting point for, for a statistical approach. So what, what could be a model? Um, so the model, the main model that will be in the, the subject matter of, uh, of this talk is a very simple model. 
um, for this kind of data. So we assume we have a known species tree. I call it S, but I don't think it returns in the talk. So we have a known species tree um, and we propose, we, we assume some kind of model of how genes, gene lineages um, evolve within the species tree. Um, usually, well, here I will always assume this kind of evolution is due to a kind of birth in that process. So gene lineages, they duplicate at a rate lambda per gene or they get lost at a rate mu per gene. Um, so this is this is the basic under, uh, model of background genome evolution, really. So, so that's how, how we assume gene families evolve. So, and then whole gene duplication events are, are included, can be included in a model by just pinpointing them on the phylogeny. Let's say here, I, I marked it in the, in the red, uh, you can see my cursor, right? Uh, in the red bar. Um, and we assume that all lineages when they pass through such an event, they duplicate and each duplicated copy is retained or non-retained with a probability Q. And then the question of, is there a signal for whole gene implication really boils down to, does this model with this whole gene implication fit the data better than a model without it? And even further, it boils down to the question, is there, is this, this single parameter in the simple model uh, Q, so Q again, it, it measures whether the probability that a duplicated gene is retained after the whole genome duplication. So we can really see this whole genome duplication event as a genome duplication slash redeploidization cycle or, or, or a transition. Um, so the probability that after redeploidization, this genome du gene duplicated gene is retained. So the, prob so the question boils down to is, is Q larger than zero actually? Mm. This simple, well, this basic model, you can call it simple, but it's, it's already a mess to do statistics with, um, is, is what was first used by um, Charlie Lee Rapier and, uh, and, and Cécile Anne, um, who implemented this uh, at some point. Okay. Um, so we have a model and we need to confront it with data, right? That's how we go about. So the first kind of approach one can take, and which is not the subject of the talk today, is gene tree reconciliation. Uh, in gene tree reconciliation, the idea is to um, so embed a known gene tree, an assumed known gene tree typically, in the species tree hypothesis. So we, um, in a typical phylogenomic pipeline, one would have inferred gene trees, and one wants to um, um, reconcile the gene trees to the species tree. And in this case, uh, we want to do this in a model-based way. So we want to do probabilistic reconciliation. Um, and so basically what we ask is, what is the likelihood of, of observing our gene trees given the species tree and this model? Um, probabilistic reconciliation is in itself already a very challenging uh, thing. It's not easy to enum enumerate all possible reconciliations to average over them or to get the maximum likelihood reconciliation. It's, it's a tricky topic. Um, there are some notable advances uh, recently, for instance, from Alexander Stamatakis lab, uh, who, who just released, I think, gene drugs or species drugs, it's called. There's some interesting stuff going on there. Um, because basically what we want to do is not only um, reconcile our inferred gene trees, we would like to take into account gene tree uncertainty as well, right? Uh, because our gene trees are usually not known without error. It's, it's a huge problem. So what people can do is do it in one big approach, um, infer the reconciled tree from an alignment, um, etc. So, so it's, it's really hard. So there, there are lots of challenges. These are only two of them. Uh, we need good prior hypotheses on the number of ancestral lineages. We need to deal with rate heterogeneity across branches of the tree, across families. Um, what if our species tree is uncertain? Uh, it's also a big problem, right? Uh, what if there's hybridization in there? Or in our case, even uh, allopolypoidy, it messes up our species tree and our gene trees and our, our reconciliation, really. Um, these models of gene family evolution, they are so simple. Are they even realistic? Um, what about ILS? Uh, the thing is all computationally very intensive. Um, we need to locate these genome duplications really in this phylogeny um, to then determine whether there is a signal for them. Can we detect them de novo in the 
all this kind of stuff um, is making this task extremely difficult. So I implemented a program which, which addresses some of these issues. It's called Whale. It does probabilistic gene tree reconciliation, and it takes into account gene tree uncertainty in a quite nice way, I think. Um, it, it's a Bayesian program. It, it does Bayesian inference, so it can take into account uh, complicated models of <coughs> rates across the tree, et cetera. So that's all nice, but still it's a, it's a huge mess to make sense of all these trees. Um, so it's, it's really hard, I think. <laughs> And so I came a bit disillusioned with it. And that's why I turned back to a simpler kind of data to confront to the model, gene content or gene counts. So um, gene content is, um, well, it's, it, it's fairly easy to see what it is. No, I mean, it's, it's the gene families. Um, uh, the gene counts. So we inferred a bunch of gene families. They are in the columns of these matrices here. Um, and we just count how many genes there is in, there are in each species, in each family. Um, so if, if you think of it, statistics is obviously always a kind of um, balancing of willful ignorance. Uh, in this case, um, when we go from trees to mere gene content, we are assuming we are ignorant of any kind of sequences, any kind of information uh, that the sequences actually give on the genealogy of the gene trees. Um, we assume we only know how many genes there are in each species, uh, in each family, which is, of course, uh, a huge uh, throwaway of information compared to the previous uh, approaches. But it turns out, well, the nice thing about it is we don't have to deal with all these challenges I listed. So. It, it's uh, things like allopolyploidy are not really that much of an issue anymore, um, or really ILS. Well, it's there, but it it won't it won't mess up our inferences that much. Um, well, all, all sorts of possible model violations become a, quite a bit less severe. Um, they are still there, but they are less likely to affect our inferences that much. So. Um, I became interested again in, um, in, in, in turning back to this like uh, uh, less rich data to see whether it can tell us anything about whole genome duplication. It would be very cool if it would, because it would make things a lot simpler. Um, so the above plot is for a bunch of yeast species. You see, you can, you can just by eyeballing see that where the whole genome duplication took place. Um, so it shows there is obviously some potential because I mean, this genome duplication took place uh, somewhere here, let's say 100 million years ago, and they're still pretty, pretty clearly there in the gene count matrix. Um, but yeah, um, so so I mean, it's obvious that it will work if we have a proper statistical model. Um, that would be a surprise if it wouldn't. But then look at uh, mm, this bunch of monocots, um, which of course. <coughs> is a real mess. Okay, we can see that Musa Akaminata, Mac here, well, it probably has some stuff going on. Maze as well, right? Oil palm maybe as well, but for the others, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I don't see much in it. So I, I wanted to, uh, well, take on this challenge again. So the basic approach is, was already, of course, tried by, by, uh, by Rabier and uh, and colleagues, and later also by uh, George Stiley, um, I think, who did a study in angiosperms. <clears throat> so um, where, we, where we fit this model, the simple model I, I showed you before, with or without whole gene implication, and do a likelihood ratio test to assess whether there is evidence for Q uh, redemption rate significant different from zero. Obviously, it works for from disease data just have a look at it. I mean, it must work. <clears throat> um, but the kind of per parameters we get, and this is from, from, from my implementation, which these are, these are Bayesian estimates. It doesn't really matter for this data set. It's all the same, basically. Um, um, although, of course, we can do branch-wise, um, uh, branch-specific rates, etc. cetera. So, so it makes the inferences a bit more, um, well, um, the model is a bit more realistic, but anyway, um, 
as we can clearly see, um, so these are pretty low rates. But what this means is um, a single gene uh, duplicates at a rate 0.03 about um, per gene per 100 million years. It's, uh, I mean, that's quite remarkable, I think. In 100 million years, only 3% 3 3 of genes will have been duplicated. Um, and loss goes on at a much higher rate, well, about twice. Um, what it says about whole gene duplication is that only about 6%, according to this uh, fit, of the genes were retained after whole genome duplication. So what that basically means is that, um, so we have a whole gene duplication, 6% of the genes are in duplicate after the whole gene duplication, and then ordinary genome evolution proceeds as it did before. I think this is a bit low, and uh, if you look at the matrix, it doesn't seem to be very um, plausible, I think. But anyway, um, let's take it what it is. Um, there is one simple approach uh, to test a different model. So I became interested in how, how uh, what does this model actually mean? Um, because, because I don't trust these rates. And one thing that is obviously um, problematic about these kind of models is that um, all genes, they get lost at the same rate. If you're in a single copy state, you get lost at the rate mu. If you're in a, uh, if you have two gene copies, you get still lost at the rate mu per gene. While it would make more sense, quite obviously, I think, that for many gene families, the rate of loss when you're in a duplicated state would be different per gene than the rate of loss when you're in a single copy state. So many genes may be, many gene families may be, um, may be uh, essential while others may, may, may be not. Uh, well. Sorry. Glass of water. Mm. So uh, an easy way to, um, there's one way that you can have an, a simple model um, that, that can be analyzed with the same inference methods um, that takes this somewhat into account, namely a model for non-extinct gene families, where we assume that the loss rate is per excess gene in a gene family. So it's, I depict it here in this, this bottom thing. So we assume that a single gene still duplicates at rate lambda per gene, as you can see here, but um, that um, loss does not occur from the single copy state um, and it does occur per ex at rate mu per excess gene. So here in white, genes extra in the family, duplicated genes extra in the family. So if we take this model, so and the, that, that makes brings us to this matrix, which is basically the same. There are some families filtered out, the ones with extinct lineages, but most of the is, is in there. Now we get a loss rate per duplicated gene of about tenfold higher. Um, <clears throat> So what this means is, um, clearly, if we look at the previous uh, matrix, the loss rate we get here is dominated by the loss, by the extinction of single copy gene families, which is pretty rare. While in this case, we get um, the loss rate per duplicated gene, which seems to be much, much higher. And this is actually uh, the things, so in early papers on genome evolution, what Lynch and Connery did, the very famous paper, was estimate this kind of loss rate. And it's, it, it, I had the feeling that there was some what confusion um, as to comparing, for instance, loss rates from CAFE um, to this loss rates, for instance, in Lynch and Connery, which measure very different things. CAFE does the thing on the left, for instance, while Lynch and Connery in their, in their case based uh, case distribution based studies, they did the thing on the right. I don't know if there was this confusion. I was confused and I had the feeling others were as well. Um, but anyway, importantly, this retention rate is, is, is very different as well here in this model. So both models in this case have their strengths and weaknesses, but what it shows um, clearly is that, um, well, <laughs> we don't have good models for gene family evolution because if we take these two things which are all reasonable in their own way, um, we get very different inferences. So by the way, um, this is all uh, performed with my uh, software for, for doing this kind of stuff. As I said, it's, I, I mostly implement things in Bayesian way and uh, for, for Bayesian inference and probabilistic programming so that we can really uh, 
um, infer like branch wise rates, etc. So the the, the, um, the branches here are colored by their loss rate in, in this model, and this is the mean loss rate across um, species, uh, etc. Anyway, just for for reference that these colors are meaningful. Um, but uh, so okay, and and uh, an important way to assess whether our models actually fit the data in the Bayesian framework is so-called posterior predictive uh, simulation, where what we do is um, we simulate, so in, in, in Bayesian inference, we typically, our end result is a sample from the posterior distribution. Um, and what we do when we do posterior predictive simulation is we sample models, parameterized models from the posterior predictive distribution, and we simulate entire data sets uh, from the posterior, basically. And this is what is, um, depicted here. So the black lines and the, and, and the, the, the bars, uh, the, the margins around it, they are simulated gene count data sets from the posterior distribution, um, while the dots are the observed data. So on the y-axis, we see the, the frequency, and on the x-axis, the number of genes in the family. So there are about, uh, so it's on the log scale, about 90% of gene families are in single copy in this species, and then about yeah, way less are in uh, duplicated, etc. So, and if you look at these posterior predictive densities, we see that our models, and this is for the, the last model, our models are, are fairly lousy in that um, for most um, lineages, it does a very poor job in predicting um, in predicting the gene count distribution. So the, the, the distribution over family sizes in species. So only for this species, it does it actually uh, do a great job, um, but but for others, when when it's in white, it's it's um, not even included in the ninety five percent posterior predictive interval. So it's not really not really good. Also, note this is on the log scale, so it may seem that the first one is really nicely aligned with the posterior predictive distribution, but if it's in white, it's outside of the ninety five percent interval. So it's not really good. Anyway. Um, So this is already a more sophisticated model than usually uh, used. I mean, it's been branch-wise duplication and loss rates, etc. But it doesn't fit. Um, but then also <laughs> the monocot data set, what about it? Um, so I told you in the yeast data set, it's easy to see where it is. And uh, we can use this easy approach of testing where the whole gene implication is. But where, where would we even start with the monocot data set? So, um, at some point, I implemented a program um, to do this kind of model-based detection, so where we don't have to a priori, a priori identify whole gene implications across the tree, but we can simply um, um, start out with a tree without whole gene implications, and the sampler, the, the algorithm, will try to look for, um, for, for where the whole gene implication happened using a technique called reversible jump. Uh, MCMC, I won't go into detail. I think this is a suggestive image that the sampler adds and takes away genome duplications across the tree. Um, so I, I published a study on that. It was a, a bit of work, but actually, um, well, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's good work, but uh, um, I started thinking more seriously about models only later. And what it actually um, so showed is it worked, it worked quite well for some lineages, let's say for, for this uh, Musa, which we know um, has, a, has a bunch of genome duplications. Well, it actually, so this plot shows you um, for each uh, branch in the species tree, this species tree or this species tree, the number of genome duplications and the posterior probability for, the, for this number of genome duplications. So the posterior probability for, uh, let's say two whole genome duplications on the Musa cuminata uh, tip branch is about 0.5. And this is very, well, the base factor is very supportive of it. And there may be also three. I mean, it's, it's, it's already quite high here. Um, so so this, this worked. And from, for oil palm as well, we, we find this nice um, as it should be. Whole gene implication for maize also uh, clearly detected. Um, then, then at the root somewhere, um, this should be one of those monocot genome duplication. I'm not sure whether it's, well, I, I suspect it's more an artifact. I don't know. I can't tell. 
Um, but there, there are more disturbing things going on, namely that for some lineages um, where it should detect something, we didn't. And in fact, I, I don't think this is disturbing. If you look at the matrix, I don't find it that surprising whether it would, that it would lack power. But what is disturbing is that it provides evidence against whole gene application. For instance, um, consider orchids, and they should have a whole gene application here, um, these guys. And, and we find very strong evidence against whole gene application in these lineages. While what I would have expected if it wasn't powerful, um, that it would be compatible with it, but it would not be significant. So, so the sampler would go, would go nicely to one or two or no or whatever. There, there would be some hints that it could be that it, at least it would be compatible with whole gene application, which is not the case um, in, in these inferences. And so what, and, and again, this, this takes into account um, different rates of background genome evolution across the tree. So it's, it should not be affected too much about those details, which were clearly um, the main drivers of issues. And in, for instance, that paper by Tiley, et cetera, um, where, where, where the real issue, I think, was often different rates of duplication and loss across branches of the species tree. But this should be taken into account here. And what this really shows, I think, is our poor models of gene family evolution, which don't fit our data. So, um, and, and which is why we cannot really go about inferring whole gene implications that easily using such an approach. So, and this to uh, go to the end of my talk. So what we need is better models of gene family evolution. So this is a bit of a sad, um, um, discovery because I spent quite a bit of time writing programs to um, infer whole gene implications with these lousy models, um, or not lousy models, but yeah, I mean, models with problems. Um, so now, since so recently I started, we're more worrying about the models themselves. Um, so what, what could bring us to better models of gene family evolution? One thing that is clearly um, that we need to take into account is rate heterogeneity across families as well. Um, it's well known that the gene, the, the size distribution of gene families, which I again plot here. So I hope this more or less makes sense to you. Um, maybe I didn't explain it well enough. So this is the number of genes in the family on the x-axis and the y-axis is the, the proportion of families of that size, right? So the size distribution typically shows this kind of power law uh, thing. It's, it's a widely reported phenomenon in uh, that this is one of those zillion of power law, uh, interesting power law distributions. Um, so, uh, and, and these simple bird and death models, they don't give rise to power laws. That's, that's well known. Um, for instance, this, this model I showed you for non-extinct families, they give rise to a geometric distribution, which is strongly under dispersed with respect to this power law, as you can see here in red. And so um, under certain, and this is, uh, um, I think it's not wide enough known, or maybe maybe I found it out. I don't know. I, I found it out by myself, but maybe others <laughs> have reported this as well. I, I honestly do not really know. But um, under some models of um, rate heterogeneity of, across families, you actually get a nice closed form solution of the stationary distribution of a simple Bertet model, but with varying rates, right? Rates across families, which is beta geometric. And this actually fits the data so so beautifully, I mean, um, yeah, it must be somewhere in our models. Um, so um, this is one thing I think it's a bit, it's, it's quite promising that, that there are simple models to account for this. So people have of course tried these uh, typical gamma distributed, discrete gamma mixtures as, as in usually in phylogenetics for, for these kind of problems. But it turns out that for some assumptions on the, how, how they co-vary actually, this duplication and loss rates, um, you get this nice beta geometric distribution, which really provides an ex a wonderful fit. This is one thing, if you don't um, believe me. So these are stationary distributions, so um, I won't go into detail, but this is really, um, again, with my methods, uh, um, uh, Bayesian uh, inference for these distributions and for, for a bunch of rice species, and you see it looks nice. So this is one, one way to make our models more realistic. Um, so this is again for the non-extinct families. 
So here we are not taking into account those guys, those single copy genes that go extinct. But then that's not really, I mean, it doesn't really uh, tackle the issue heads on um, because what's really happening is that not every gene within a gene family um, uh, gets lost or duplicates at the same rate. If you're in a single copy state, then your rate of loss per gene should be different than if you're in a duplicated copy state, etc. So this has been my most uh, recent work uh, on, a, on a more sophisticated model of gene family evolution, which is actually, as you see in this picture, a bivariate model, where we have two types of genes in the gene family. You can think of them as the base genes and the excess genes. And we have base genes duplicating at rate lambda. Um, well, we have all genes duplicating at rate lambda, but base genes get lost at a lower rate than do excess genes, and base genes can turn into excess genes. So this is what happens here. Let, let's, let's go very briefly through it. If you're in the single copy state, you can duplicate. Then you get another uh, a base gene and an excess gene. Um, this excess gene could then subfunctionalize or neo-functionalize and become a base gene. So it becomes kind of essential, you may say. And then you end up in this state. Um, or you may duplicate again, you get two excess genes. But anyway, you get, you get the, uh, a more complicated evolutionary process. Um, so so and under this model, which is a kind of two-type branching process model, um, or a, a two-type birth death process model, I mean, I, I, I've, I've referred to it as two-type branching process because it connects better to the, the probabilistic literature around it, but it's, it's still just a birth and death process model. These two terms are more or less interchangeable. They mean a bit different things, but anyway, um, it's a more complicated model, which should capture more of the actual gene family evolutionary process. Um, and so these are some, some parameter inferences for these models. Um, we can, we can take a look at the yeast again on the right column. So this is what, um, what I showed you first. The usual uh, simple birth and death model, as we can have it, for instance, in CAFE uh, or in WGDGC from Rabier, etc. cetera. Um, so these kind of um, simple birth and death models. Now, um, they give you these rates. And then there is this. Um, model without extinction in there, so with non-extinct gene families, where we have loss at a much larger rate, as I told you before. And then in this two-type birth death model, um, you get everything at once. So it, it, that's, that's really nice about it. So, um, so we have uh, the duplication rate, which is nicely aligned with these guys. The loss rate of genes, um, of base genes, which conforms to this loss rate that is really driven by single copy gene families. And then there is this loss rate of excess genes, which is way higher, which conforms more to this loss rate of uh, non-extinct genes. So, okay. Um, and, and, and we can have this kind of, uh, this is also fun about this model that we have this kind of rate by which duplicated like redundant genes become essential. We can estimate this kind of thing. So about 2% uh, of genes um, which are redundant, they became essential, something like that. Um, so anyway, um, by now I, I might have lost some of you, um, uh, but um, I hope um, I can um, clearly show to you that our, so as I told you in my first slide, um, uh, it's about my struggles. Um, so I'm still struggling with these models and I think we all should, and that's maybe our, uh, my message. Um, so um, yeah, I hope I hope we can go to to better models of genome evolution. Really, that that's where I'm. What I will be working on for the rest of my PhD, basically. Um, thanks a lot for listening to me. Sorry if it was a bit quick or, you know, I'm happy to take any questions. Here are some links um, and relevant publications. Um, also, thanks to my supervisor Eve. Um, I don't know. I don't think he's here. But anyway, thanks for. Um, supporting me don't think thinking i'm doing obscure stuff uh, anyway <laughs> thanks a lot all right well, well thank you arthur for a wonderful talk uh as usual we'll let folks um put their uh questions in the chat box and then pop on their audio and video uh to ask those questions um
I suppose I think these are really, really great models and I enjoyed your latest preprint uh, as well. I think this is the, uh, always been sort of one of the challenges and limitations I think in trying to infer these, you know, the events is the background rates and the models are so, well, they're just too simple. They're not realistic, right? They're just too simple. They don't capture all that variation. And um, so I, I think it's really awesome to see, you know, this work uh, and making these models uh, capture much more of the, you know, the, the, the rate of heterogeneity and the variation in the rates and accounting for those as well as the transitions that actually occur, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the, 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 the latest preprint as well on that. Um, so uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Carl says they were awesome talks. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question, Carl. I guess mine was too. So, you know. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. I think uh, was I also a bit too long. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, that's okay. They were both went long today, but um, they were both really great talks. And and this is pretty elastic. There's no, you know, we don't have to leave a, a lecture hall or something for a class afterwards. So this is yeah, uh, no, but I I didn't really <laughs> intend to be on on like. 20 minutes, but it didn't work out. I think you went for about 32 or so. Oh, uh, damn it. Even, even with the other time, that's all right. Both of you, both the folks, you had, both had a lot to say and it was it was really great to hear. Um, all right, so uh, so Carl has got a question. Carl, feel free to pop on and, and uh, ask your question if you'd like. It's always good to see people these days still, you know. <laughs> We're here. Those are That's awesome right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, or, um, maybe Arthur, sorry, my question, uh, if I understand correctly, you had this interesting observation about the distribution that fits your gene count data, uh, that beta geometric. Do you get that mm -hmm. distribution out of your birth death uh, neo-functionalization model? No. Um, well, yes and no. Um, it does, but currently it's too computationally intensive uh, to really do these inferences well it's not too it's it's possible but um, the thing is um, so this beta geometric distribution uh, in the right if, if, if you assume a beta uh, a beta distribution on the rate uh, on the ratio of the duplication rate on the loss rate of these excess genes um, so the loss rate of duplicated redundant genes um, and this arises under some other conditions, doesn't matter, but these are plausible uh, distributional assumptions. Then um, the the distribution, the stationary distribution, becomes this beta geometric thing. But if we want to incorporate it in the in the transient distributions that we use to compute our likelihoods, etc., then we need to do the whole mixture modeling uh, business as we do it in phylogenetics. For instance, with the discrete gamma stuff, we get different distributional assumptions, but the nice thing about the stationary distribution is that it allows us to, um, we can easily fit the parameters based on the stationary distribution um, and include them in the models without having to estimate them because the stationary distribution parameters, they they can really be directly used. Anyway, what I, uh, an answer to your question, um, if you include this rate heterogeneity, um, this, this beta distribution on this ratio of, of, of two parameters, then um, also this multi-type branching process model will give you this kind of nice uh, power law distribution. And I showed this in, in, in the last figure actually of, of, the, of the preprint. Thanks well, for thank the you. question. All right, well, any other questions today uh, for either Joe or, uh, or Arthur? Oh, All right. I have okay. a quick question for Arthur. So with the um, uh, really, really nice talk, by the way, for, uh, for both of the talks. Um, so for Arthur, um, with the uh, gene cam method, so how deep of a WGD that you think we can infer uh, with this type of um, approach for, the, for using gene cam? Since, you know, things are, you know, eventually getting deployed, I was just curious, you know, whether you test that, um, you know, how deep that we can infer those. So yeah, as I, as I try to convey a bit with my talk, I'm, I'm um, um, to answer that question, we need, we need better models first. I mean, that, that's a bit, uh, um, so that was a bit my, my um, 
my disappointment really that I, I worked on this, for instance, this reversible jump method, um, which took quite a bit of programming. Uh, anyway, what it was interesting to work on. But then it turned out, yeah, it didn't work quite as nicely as I expected it. I, as I, as I tried to say, like, I would be very happy if it uh, would be not, po not powerful, that, but if it wouldn't be powerful in a meaningful way, I mean, that, that there, I just want the uncertainty to be, be correct in there. That, that's the main obsession, right? Um, I don't want to be certain of something that's not the case. Um, so, and that's why we need better models. Um, I mean, that's, that's what every, uh, I mean, I guess that's, that's for, that counts for every statistician and uh, for, ev for everyone dealing with statistics, but in phylogenetics, it's just so, I mean, we have it all over the place, right? That, that we get just wrong answers with very, very, very certain wrong answers. And that's such a horrible thing. So on your question, um, how deep can we go? I can tell um, it's hard to say by by looking at these matrices. As I as I said, it it seems that we well from the monocot case, for instance, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't give you much information about deep events. But I honestly can't tell because I think we need to fix the models first. Yeah. Cool, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna comment too on that. It, for, for Arthur's sake, it's it's very similar. It reminds me of the with our Chromoval sort of models. The you know, especially as you get past that first layer of duplication events, then the signal in the chromosome numbers, you know, is so just isn't very informative, I think, right? And it gives you these really certain answers that there wasn't anything, you know, mm. super deep in the tree because it just, there's nothing. I think partly it's also the information content. In the case of the chromosome numbers, the, the models don't really account for, you know, differences among lineages, but, you know, everything kind of gets back to this mode number pretty fast. And then, there's no data to support. There's no more information to, to really support anything. So it confidently will tell you, yeah, there's nothing happening back here. <laughs> when in fact, you know, we know that they're, they're happening. So um, yeah, the, with the Chrome Evolve thing, it's interesting. So I didn't mention it. It should be in the, in the presentation on statistical inference of, of right. communication, obviously. But um, the thing is, yeah. Um, so I was focusing on genome data based. Um, but anyway, uh, the, it works very well, but it's, you have you have the single single bit of information, and this is the potential, of course, of these gene counts. Also, I mean, right, that you can work with that just that maybe, one kind of dimension of data. Yeah, yeah, there may be yeah. there's much faster evolution going on, but you have much more data. And an yep. interesting thing I want to um, add to to Zheng's question um, is there are ways to um, that we can think of um, using these so. I don't think that these gene count methods, even if they would be poor um, in, in terms of information content, will be um, 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 worthless. Because, for instance, you may may and this is this is um, one of the things I'm working on. For instance, if you look uh, what I said in the beginning, um, chromosome assemblies, etc. We we have this genome structure now uh, much more often, so we should take that into account. But you can look at um, the subset of anchors in your of anchor points, for instance, in your gene count matrices, etc. So you can get a more um, a subset of these gene counts, for instance, only those the counts of genes that are synthetic to each other, for instance, um, which will go much deeper um, in terms of what uh, in, in, in time and what what kind of information it will give you. So um, there is some room there for if we get the models right to to think of ways that uh, that they can uh, Prone deeper based on the uh, well, um, yeah, based on on the rich information that we have in the genome data. All right. Well, uh, one last question there for Joe, I think, and then we'll to wrap it up. Uh, we'll be getting into our schedules here for for those of us here in the West Coast. Still, uh, I still I have, got a I have office hours coming up, so <laughs> I'll let uh, so Joe. Uh, so Joe, there looks like a question from Carl, um, and Carl could pop back on his mic there. Uh, if he wants. <laughs> Just ask Joe whether uh, there's any similar studies looking at spore plants and, and spore size evolution. Uh, as far as spore size goes, there's a, a recent PhD from Martin Birds, one of his students at Peterson, I think, on spore size, but I don't think they did polyploidy on that. And um, obviously that should affect spore size as well. They can often be polyploid, but I mean, uh, multicellular uh, also. So that would be, would be good to, to look into that. Uh, bryophytes are known for having high levels of polyploidy. So. Mm. 
Yeah, there's the old Barrington paper, right, Carl? The uh, from like eighty was that the eighty nine or ninety one or something, right? With Conant and Barrington and those guys, and then I know that um, Rene Lopez Smith too you know, has done uh, a bit of this. We worked together on some Ceratopteris stuff, making oh. neo neo tetraploids <laughs> to see if it infected the sperm swimming uh, yeah. uh, in neos and uh, and fertilization. And she did she did this wonderful job of getting these TEMs of the these SEMs, excuse me, of the the tetraploid sperm trying to go down the the, the archegonial oh, wow. neck, you know. Yeah, and, uh, I love to see that. Wow, it, it's pretty cool. I've got I've got these high res pictures somewhere. We got to get that. I got to reconnect with her and get that that pushed out sometime here. Um, she has really yeah, beautiful they have, pictures. So, Ceratopsis has giant spores, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But that that was wonderful. I well, I, I think we need to wrap up fully here and. Um, uh, I appreciate both you and Arthur. You gave really great talks today, and, and thanks everyone else for hanging out uh, and sticking with it. Um, uh, we're way over our normal time, um, but uh, these were these are really really wonderful talks and on topics that are really near and dear to my heart. Thinking about how you know these nucleotidic effects and um, and all this the complexity of, of gene family evolution uh, that really confounds a lot of our inferences of these deep events. So. Um, and it's really fun to see the progress being made on on these fronts by by both of you. Um, well, tune in in two weeks for everybody that's still out there. Um, we will have two two more speakers in the series. Uh, up first will be some, uh, Samita Nassib, uh talking to us about quantitative genetics and uh, biotechnology uses of novel yeast uh, hybrids, presumably some owl polyploids in there. Uh, and then Eric Schrenz will talk about um, uh, grab your partner dosi do the tetraploidy hexaploidy two step in Cleomacy. Uh, and so uh, uh, tune in, uh, uh, that'll be on April uh, 26th um, uh, for a couple of great talks uh, uh, looking at uh, more issues in polyploidy. All right. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up and everybody have a, have a great day. <laughs>